a note from Lisa High that she would be unable to attend. But uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us for our fall State Forest Advisory Committee meeting. Barrett, I'll turn it over to you to uh, do a roll call with the SFAC members. Sure. In fact, uh, maybe, um, maybe April, do you have, um, you probably have uh, been documenting who, who might or might not be attending uh, or who, who's already left, you know, uh, we're not going to have um, Denise to attend. Lisa, hi, is that right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Denise and Lisa, I got a notification from. Okay. As, as well as Chris Inquist, I just got a note from him that he's not going to be able to make it. Do you need me to pull up the roster, Barrett? Okay. Well, what I'm thinking of is that would be, that would be better, realizing between the list of who's on the phone on the screen, it'd be better to get have my hands on a roster. All right, I'm trying to pull it up, but with the two screens, it's not giving me the option to pull it up like normal. You, you can go ahead and uh, send it to me if you, if you like, and I'll <clears throat> uh, talk about the uh, public comment. Uh, I, I got it, process. Here, Barrett, I think we got it. Yeah. That'll make it uh, easy. Although you control the, the Zoom, uh, it's a magnification, so I can't see the whole document. Here I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Barrett. I don't know if it's me on my end or on your end. How others are hearing Barrett? It's yeah. The the audio is is kind of broken there. Okay. Uh, let me know if that's any uh, any different or if I got a unstable internet uh, situation. Ah, let me do that. I, I could go ahead and, and and call the names and just see if we got. If that's helpful, Barrett. Go go ahead. I'll stop my video for a while and see if that's any help. Go go ahead, sure. uh, Margaret Magruder, Commissioner. Are you here? Okay, we don't have Margaret right now. Uh, Susan Obermeyer. I'm here. Great, we got Susan. Mike Kennedy. I'm here. Uh, Lisa High is excused. Uh, Barrett Brown is here as a chair. Right. Ken, Ken McCall. Good morning, I'm here. Okay, and then we have uh, Denise Lofman, who is also excused, and Chris Inquist, who is excused. Mike McKibben. Yeah. I'm here. Good morning, Mike. Uh, Good afternoon morning. now. Good afternoon now. Greg, Greg Jacob. <laughs> don't, don't have Greg currently. Uh, Lisa Phipps. She's uh, Tom Scoggins. I'm here. Leslie Shaw. Don't have Leslie and Amanda Astor. I'm here. Okay. Welcome, Amanda. And, and Ron, I see Greg just joined. Okay, great. Hello, Greg. We just did a quick roll call and we've got you accounted for. Welcome. Okay. So again, yeah. good afternoon. Noon, everybody. I'm Ron Zilli. I serve as the planning deputy for, for State Forest, one of the, the co-conveners. We'll go through a round of uh, introductions for ODF staff that are going to be presenting today. There's going to be a couple that join us later, and we'll introduce a few other ODF staff that are, that are here. I'll go ahead to you first, Andy. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and happy Friday. I'm Andy White, the Northwest Oregon Area Director. Great. Uh, Liz, go ahead to, to you next. 
Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Liz Dent, and I serve as the State Forest Division Chief. Appreciate y'all putting your time into this. Well, uh, Derek Bangs. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, NRS Derek Bangs, NRS three with the Planning Coordination Unit. Okay, Colleen Kaiser. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Colleen Kaiser, and I am the State Forest Planning Manager. Kyle Kopp. Hi there, my name's Kyle Kopp. I'm the Acting Sanium Unit Forester out of the North Cascade District, ODF. Jason Cox. Good morning, Jason Cox, ODF Public Affairs. Okay. Don't think, is Mike Wilson here with us yet? He'll be joining us later. So Mike Wilson is not here with us yet. He'll be joining us later, uh, as well as Ramona Archega. Uh, to round out the folks that will be presenting on the agenda. And then just going around, we have many representatives from some of our field districts here uh, today. So uh, go over to Astoria, uh, Ty Williams. Good afternoon, Ty Williams, the District Operations Coordinator. Okay, great. Let's see if we've got anybody on from, from Tillamook District. Not seeing anyone. We've got uh, going over to Forest Grove and the REI program. We've got um, Laura Fredrickson. Good afternoon, all. Uh, Laura Fredrickson, Recreation, Education, and Interpretation Manager, situated in the Northwest Oregon area. Glad you're all here. Thank you. Great. How about sticking with REI? We'll go to Randy Peterson. Good morning, everybody. Randy Peterson, Recreation Program Manager, based out of Forest Grove. Okay, and we also have, uh, I saw Jennifer from Forest Center. Yeah, good morning, Jennifer Magby, Director of the Tillamook Forest Center. Okay. I did see Steph Beal. Are you there, Steph, from Forest Grove? Yes, good morning. Steph Beal, the Operations Coordinator for the Forest Grove District. How about out South Fork, Dave Luttrell? Good afternoon, everyone. Dave Luttrell, South Fork Camp Manager. Okay. Just a couple other folks we've got. We've got uh, Justin Butteris, our uh, policy analyst from State Forest, joining us as well. Good afternoon. Justin Butteris, policy analyst for the division. I apologize if I, Mike Wilson has joined us now as well, so I'll let you do an introduction, Mike. Hey, good afternoon, Mike Wilson. Uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm the policy deputy uh, alongside Ron with uh, State Force. Okay. And Jody Kroon. Hi, Jody Kroon, planning coordinator with the State Force Division. Okay, and I got a whole group of folks out here in West Oregon District around a table. So anybody from West Oregon, Mike Curran, Michael Curran and company? Yeah, uh, Michael Curran, I'm the district forester for ODS West Oregon District and I'll let Evelyn. Evelyn Dukari, uh, State Forest Unit Manager. Kyle uh, Smith, Community District Coordinator for REI is also here. Okay, great. So apologize if I've missed anyone. Uh, April Davis, don't want to forget her. She helps us keep the whole thing together. So go ahead, April. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, April Davis, Northwest Oregon Area Executive Assistant and SFAC Administration. Okay. Oh, great. Not Hello? bad. Not bad, Ron. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, we've got, uh, thank you all for being flexible, firstly, in adjusting the time of the meeting today. I suppose many of you are, are already aware, um, if others aren't, you know, we adjusted the meeting because the uh, board had a special meeting, Board of Forestry had a special meeting this morning to contemplate the appointment of the next state forester. And they made a, a decision as a board uh, to do that. If you have not heard, there's a press release that will be coming out uh, very soon if it hasn't already, uh, that the Oregon Board of Forestry voted unanimously to appoint Kalamukamoto as Oregon's 14th state forester during a special meeting today. 
Uh, Cal is going to you know work with the Department of Forest for your Human Resources Department on you know his terms of employment and starting date. So getting him on board. Uh, if you don't know Cal, he's a forester and management consultant from Coos Bay. He has a bachelor's degree in forest management from Humboldt State and a master's in business administration from the University of Washington. He has a diverse leadership experience that spans public and private sectors. It includes work in the field of economic development, natural resource management, turnaround solutions, and biomass energy development. He's worked extensively with Native American business communities, and he served on the board of six tribal enterprises. Uh, Cal has also served on the chair of the Oregon Parks and Recreation Committee and vice chair of the Oregon Board of Forestry. So he's familiar with our department's work. Uh, as a member of the, the U.S. Board for, steward, for the Stewardship Council, he's also worked with local forest collaboratives to include a uh, chairing Metolius multi-party management team for eight years. Uh, so he's got a lot of experience he brings with him. We're really excited to have a new state forester appointed. Uh, you know, continue to be grateful for the service Nancy Hirsch has provided in the interim. Um, really uh, value what she brings in her career of experience back to the agency through this time of transition. And we really look forward to getting to know Cal better and getting into that leadership position and moving forward with a lot of the important work we've got to do as a department for Oregonians. So next chapter in our, our book has been titled and we're going to start writing it. So our future is, uh, is, is moving, ahead, moving ahead. I'll uh, turn it over to Barrett now. Public comment? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ron. Um, we've got uh, roughly 34 participants. Uh, appreciate, everybody, appreciate everybody for being on in the meeting. Um, we'll set aside uh, some time this morning for uh, members of the public to provide a comment. Um, we'd like to uh, do a quick survey and maybe introduce yourself if you're interested in speaking today. If you're interested in providing public comment, um, use the raise hand feature and we'll call on you. Right, and we have some. Okay. Thanks for uh, keeping an eye we've got uh, Greg, is that your your hand up, Greg? Greg Jacobs. Hmm. Or did you just uh, just lower your hand, Greg? Did Did you hear me, or was I on? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I'm sorry. Oh, you didn't. Oh, I'm no. sorry myself. I was okay. I ask if uh, when it comes to the AOPs, uh, do do we have an opportunity to make a comment during that part of the meeting today? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll definitely be. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I was just going to say, Greg, you as a as a committee member can engage on any of the items at any time. This is a specific public comment opportunity for non-members to bring anything to the department and the committee uh, that might be on their minds that's of relevant business to our plan implementation that the committee might consider advising us on. Okay, thank you. Terrific, and um, you know, we, it's, you know, I, I wanna try and help, uh, you know, folks who take the time to attend our meeting as members of the public. Um, to <clears throat> set them up uh, with the uh, right expectations so they can they can provide comment and um, we particularly in these times of uh, fairly compact agendas um, you know we we are unfortunately you know required to restrict public comment to these designated uh, periods in the meeting and unless we we need to call on somebody for some resource information uh, always hard when we especially when we have um, well informed and you know, I highly valued attendees helping helping it work our process. But um, so, if we hear nobody um, here to provide public comment, we'll move on. This is the fall meeting of our State Forest Advisory Committee. It's a it's a, typically a an important meeting where we do uh, um, hear a couple accomplishment reports on the previous uh, AOP. And um, we get a lot of participation from the districts as a chance for them to talk about what they have achieved. And so it's an important part of our 
year's work on the committee. Uh, Derek, I think we'll start start with you right off the bat. Um, are you, uh, do I see you on the screen? There you are, Derek. I'm here. All right, uh, so as a reminder to everybody, uh, my name is Derek Bangs and I am an NRS3 planner with the planning coordination team. So hopefully everyone's had a chance to see the accomplishment report. I'll be doing a quick overview of it today. I don't plan on reading every single line in it as it is a nine page document. However, I will attempt to condense it down to some of the larger line items on the page as I go. If I do not cover something that someone would like more detail on, or if you have any questions, I'll see what I can do to answer them. And if I cannot, I will go back to the meeting once I have gotten the correct information. My plan is to pull up the document and point out a few key items on each page and move on. I'll pause prior to moving to the next page to give everyone time to comment if needed. And I will have time at the end of the presentation if you'd like to reserve your questions until then. Uh, please use the raise hand function as that'll help me understand if someone has a question. Uh, with that being said, uh, does anybody have a question before I get started? Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, is everybody able to see my shared screen here? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. So as stated, I'll touch on a few items on each page. If there's questions on anything that I've mentioned or any other item on the page, I can answer those at the end of each page. <laughs> So page one is a quick harvest summary. All of the districts were able to accomplish their AOPs and sell them prior to this meeting. Sold volume fluctuates somewhat by district, but as can be seen here overall, we're tracking very close to the initial estimate. The largest discrepancy here is North Cascade, and that's primarily due to the uncertainty around salvage numbers prior to completed sale layout. One other item to note is that due to some of the larger sales having more board feet than was originally planned for, the Astoria district was able to meet their volume targets and still move several sales over to fiscal 22. This is more obvious when we look at the acres numbers on a subsequent page. Um, I'll stop real quick. And Amanda, did you have a question? Yeah, just really quick. Could you uh, zoom in on your screen a little bit sure. so that we can see the numbers a little bit better? Are you Thank you very much. Numbers? Okay. Yeah, that's a lot better. Thanks, Derek. So that's the volume summary table. I'll scroll down then since, so you can see the IP summary. And for the IP table, please note that North Cascade has just gone undergone an IP revision due to the results of the restoration work on that district post Labor Day fires. For all the other districts, the implementation plans we were working under were last approved from 2009 to 2012, depending on the district. All of the districts are tracking pretty much right on their IP targets. For the most part, all the districts are within 1% of their IP target. And please note that this is 1% over the cumulative nine to 12 years of implementation for all districts, with the exception of North Cascade, who, as I mentioned, just got a new implementation plan. So they are in the year. Um, and as promised, I will pause here to see if anybody has any questions. All right, moving on. At the top of this page, we are looking at the net value summary for the year. Hopefully, we were again blessed with strong timber market, which allowed us to exceed our planned value by approximately 21%. The next table covers our planned versus contract acres. As was mentioned in the previous page, due to more volume per acre than was anticipated on a few sales, we were able to meet our volume and value targets and move a couple of the primary sales from several districts into the next fiscal year. This movement of sales is why there is less overall acres harvested than was originally planned. And as stated before, the biggest change here was actually on the Astoria district. Uh, Greg, go ahead. This might be where I could ask, because I haven't seen it in the AOP regarding um, acreage set aside for stands that are over 80 years old or for old growth stands within the districts. Um, I was curious as to what percentage or how many acres within the five districts that are uh, off limits to logging if they're within that old growth structure. So, so the question, I'll, I'll have to get this answer to you because I don't have it off the top of my head, but the question that you're asking is um, how many acres 
by district or overall is over 80 years old that is in our um, desired future condition complex. Is that, is that the question? Yes, by district. I'll, I'll have to get that information to you, Greg. I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. I think um, on that point, um, the, you know, the, the percentage of, uh, of acres in uh, uh, DFC complex or older forest structure wouldn't, in particular, wouldn't necessarily speak to being off, the, the, the concept of being off limits to logging. Um, so that's, those might be two questions there. Um, Greg, if we wanted to get, um, if I can put a finer point, have you put a finer point on your question? Um, because of the older forest structure designation doesn't necessarily mean it's um, set, set aside or pre prevented from harvest activity in the, under the current plan. Uh, uh, yeah, I know it, that it may not be set, as, I mean, it may not be set aside for logging, but in the big picture, because there's so much literature, so much commentary about how the um, Pacific Coast forests uh, can, uh, are better stores of carbon than even the uh, forests in the Amazon, and that a lot of uh, foresters across the nation are saying that uh, we need to, in regard to climate change and carbon storage, um, uh, value these old growth stands, the little, the few that are left, value uh, trees 80, 100 years old because they're such, uh, <clears throat> well, they do a lot with, with uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And so in my mind, I was hoping that the districts would, would be, would have some statistic as to statistics about what areas within their districts they may not want to log because they, those trees play such a vital role in sequestering carbon. That's the big picture from my perspective. <laughs> There's, I'll jump in here for a second, Derek, because there is a lot there, as we all know, you know, climate change and, and carbon sequestration uh, considerations are an important part of uh, forest management planning. The, the Board of Forestry coming up next week at their November meeting is considering their uh, climate change and carbon uh, plan framework uh, that's going to be discussed at that board meeting for adoption as a framework. And we're also, as you're aware, going through a, a revision to our forest management plan, and they kind of tear off of each other, you know, the board's uh, climate and carbon change plan, and then how that might inform, you know, strategies within our, our next forest management plan. And I think that's where the direct connection is going to be made to how we consider, you know, our forest's condition and our approach to managing Oregon State Forests with a carbon uh you know, consideration that's deliberately tied and built into the plan. You know, currently it's around forest structure and we can certainly draw proxies from that. Um, but I just wanted to point out, you know, specifically to Greg's comment that the, the reasons and basis for our landscape design is multifaceted and, uh, you know, gives a lot of considerations to a whole host of things that it provides, but it isn't just solely uh, for carbon, although we recognize the importance of that uh, currently. Yeah, and if I may say one more thing, of course, uh, it's not just carbon. We all know that it has to do with water quality, with um, habitat for species and you name it. So yeah, okay. Well, thanks for giving me an opportunity to raise the question, appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for speaking up, Greg. Um, yeah, Derek. Sure, um, before I continue on here, was there any other questions on either the planned or the, um, the harvest value. Not seeing any hands. Hey, Derek, oh, I just Amanda? raised mine. Yeah, oh, go ahead. sorry about that. I know it's okay. Uh, you looked away right when, right when I raised it up. So I was a little bit late on the, the hand raise. Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, with Astoria, um, obviously there was a little bit made up um, on the partial cut side uh, compared to the planned and then actual contracted on the regen side. A um, little bit hard to understand the total uh, contract, uh, you know, cut acres compared to planned. Um, 
trying to kind of do a this versus that. It looks like we're right about at a 100%, I'd say, for a total planned versus contracted. Um, if that dips below, is there any, um, you know, requirement to make that up? Um, recognizing that, you know, the department said they'd do one thing, didn't achieve that, or maybe overachieved or whatever. Um, is there any kind of reconciliation there um, moving forward, um, especially recognizing that funds from these sales uh, go to, to trust counties and that they rely on, uh, rel you know, on that sustainability there? And same with industry, right? We need to know, uh, you know, we plan our activities and AOL's members plan their investments in, in equipment and things based on what is said to be done. So just, just wondering kind of what happens there. Sure. Um, and the short answer is absolutely. Um, so the, the part that we get driven on the most is the volume side. We have a, the volume requirement. And so the reason that these, uh, that for the Astoria district, it, it's at 65% is uh, some of the sales cruised over volume. And so we didn't need them in order to meet that volume target. And so since that is our target throughout the year, what we do is we are continually evaluating that. And if we're meeting that target, then we just continue with all of the sales and produce, you know, 200% of the volume. We move that to the next fiscal year so that we're trying to maintain as close to 100% of that volume target, understanding that those resources are critical to the counties. Um, and the easiest way of showing that is, is this IP range um, where you can kind of see that we're tracking within 1% because we make a change to that target for the next year, every year, um, so that we see if we need to make a slight fluctuation, did we undercut one year and then we need to overcut a little bit um, higher the next year. So if our goal was 73 and say we did 69, then that might mean that we need to cut 75 in the following year. And we try to maintain that as close to that target over time. And, and honestly, the, the numbers as you look over this 10 year period are, are pretty impressive to me um, to be within 1% over, over 10 years is, is pretty dialed in. But just a quick follow-up if that's okay, uh, Chair Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to follow up on that point. So um, I, I get that absolutely the volume aspect there and, and how that works for sustained yield management. Um, related to the, the regeneration, so basically what you're saying is that uh, related to structure-based management, um, just trying to kind of reconcile this in my own brain, um, yes, that decision might have been due to volume estimates being higher than uh, what was cruised out or what was anticipated to be cruised initially. Uh, does that mean that those other acres were not part of a goal to reach a certain level of um, of, uh, of younger aged forests or to, you know, create habitat for undulates or something like that. There was no other goal other than that timber, uh, that timber volume goal. Just again, trying to, from an ecological point of view, trying sure. to understand if there were negatives, I guess, to, to reducing that harvest. So we have a, a percentage of the forest that's set aside in what we call complex um, desired feature condition, uh, a mix of layered and, and OFS. And then the other piece um, is referred to as a whole host of other, you know, general, um, we, we generally call it general ground. And those are the areas that we can target for more regeneration harvest. Um, and so what we try to do is, you know, there's those 30% for the Astoria district, or it changes based on the district um, between 30 to 40%, depending on um, the implementation plan for that district. But um, those are the areas that we set aside for that complex forest. And then the rest of the areas are where we have to look at for those regeneration harvests. And so essentially by us being able to meet the target volume uh, without having to go into some of those extra stands, that gives us a larger suite of stands to look at for the next year for uh, potential harvest units. Okay, yeah, I just wanna be clear that there's no you know early seral habitat type um, structure that we uh, missed out on or that we had to go for that we didn't achieve. Um, but it, it sounds like, um, sounds like we're good there. Okay. Are there any other questions before I move to the next piece? 
Right. <clears throat> Moving on to threat and endangered species survey results. Uh, we continue to have a robust t &E surveying program. Over this last year, we had three presence detections for marble murrelets, which will result in new marble murrelet management areas. One of these was on the Tillamook District and the other two were on the West Oregon District. We did not have any new spot northern spotted owl sites. We did, however, have one owl site that we abandoned, which was the Granite Owl Circle in the West Oregon District. For those of you that are not aware, these abandonments occur when we have gone a number of years without any detections and is an official process with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Private Forest Division Wildlife Biologist, where we show that we have done our due diligence checking and these owl sites are considered abandoned and the circle is removed from the landscape. Questions on t &E survey. Okay. Rolling over to project work. Project work tracked pretty much right on where we had anticipated with some fluctuations, primarily due to sales being moved to the next fiscal and some of the work that would have been accomplished with those sales instead being performed with sales that remained in the fiscal. That sounds complicated, but a good example of this is a larger crushing project that we wanted to assure, ensure occurred. So we went ahead, even though we moved that sale to the next fiscal, we crushed it this year so that we would have the rock available for, for sales in the in the subsequent year. And that's why you'll see like the AOP number for Astoria is a little higher because we did some of that work this year that we had planned on sales that we bumped forward. What other, what other unit gets to say they crushed it in their AOP reporting? <laughs> um, can I, uh, I, I stuffed a joke in there to uh, uh, point out that we're lucky to have uh, Commissioner Margaret Magruder join. Um, so thanks, Margaret. Uh, would, um, I don't know. Um, let's. Would you like to introduce yourself, Margaret, if you're if you're on? Certainly, um, Margaret Magruder, Columbia County Commissioner. Sorry, I was a little late. I I had scheduled giving blood, and uh, they didn't do it quite as quickly as I had anticipated. So, got a little behind. This is really interesting, Derek. I, I, will we do we have this a whole report um, so that I can look at it later and digest it? Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, you know, Ron, I don't know if you sent this out to just the um, SFAC members, but we could add Margaret on. No, she she is an SFAC member, and uh, she should have been in the distribution. I'll check. There oh, was I, I may have I may have it, and I just didn't. Uh, no. Too many too many things are coming across the email. I can't keep up. Yeah, that, Thanks, that's wrong. Okay, and there was one minor change, very minor, related to some South Fork stuff, but I'll send out that update to everyone here very shortly. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Margaret. Go ahead, Derek. Sure. Uh, so on the projects table, you know, the, probably the biggest line item on the table that is different from previous years is the staggering number of miles of road improvement in the North Cascade District, as has been mentioned numerous times. Uh, this is due to the associated restoration efforts post fire, and it's been a pretty impressive lift by that district. So I'll give I'll give Kyle a bit of a shout out on that one. Um, it, it clearly dominates the page as far as the the, the miles of work done. Below projects is our stream restoration tables. The totals here are all pull, pulled from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. There was a total of six projects reported over this last year with three being completed in Astoria and three in North Cascade. These included stream enhancement log placement, replacement of existing pipes with upgraded pipes or bridges and vacating where we removed a potential blockage and did not replace the pipe. Transportation and planning improvements continue on all districts with a focus on disconnect and moving road systems out of riparian management areas where feasible and appropriate. Any questions? All right. My favorite page, the one that's just all text. Uh, so stand level inventory. The big story here is that we've begun the first steps on embarking on a new inventory system 
really use a combination of LIDAR and field plots to get, us, get a much more accurate inventory of our forest. The LIDAR has been completed and the first round of plot data has been processed. We're hoping to be able to transition into this new inventory for the majority of state forests in the summer of 2022. The narrative here goes into a fair amount of detail as it's a pretty complex topic. I will do my best to answer any questions if someone has one, but uh, it does go into quite a bit of detail if, if someone just wants a long read. Young stand management, as mentioned throughout this document and the presentation here, a uh, big change from previous years is the number of acres on the San Am district. Historically, this number has been around 500 and the San Am has been a focus of our young stand management teams. Prioritizing getting the stands devastated our planted and growing productive forest. Please note here that the acres planted on North Cascade actually include both the initial planting as well as the category which calls out aerial seeding. Uh, the increase in initial planting acres were areas that were burned in the fire that could easily be planted with the trees that were available. The aerial seeding was done in areas that were not economically feasible to log due to the small size of the trees or poor access, and it was a safer way to get new trees back into these areas. One other item to note on the top table is the number of completed PCT acres was significantly lower than planned. This was primarily due to workforce capacity issues related to COVID and bids coming in much higher than budgeted, which was a result of a high demand for contractors. This was primarily again on the Astoria district and this is being looked at in fiscal 22 and the goal is to catch up on these acres at that time. Are there any questions on the young stand management piece? Not seeing any, I shall move on to recreation. So to offset the inventory page, the recreation page is a page of numbers. And this one boils down to over the fiscal year 21, we focus primarily on maintaining and improving the existing system with an increased focus on trail and facility assessments of the San Am post fire. We continue to look for small opportunities for growth of our trail systems and campgrounds. This was done with a combined effort of volunteers, South Fork crews and recreation staff members. One important item to note here is that many of the records of the North Cascade District were lost in the fire. Additionally, due to COVID, campgrounds were delayed in opening for the calendar year, which impacted numbers. I have some descriptions of some of the projects that were completed on the next page. Is there any questions? All right. Several new REI projects began or were completed during this last year. On the facilities planning front, we completed post-fire assessments on all facilities on the San Am, completed design work for the Drift Creek Trailhead project, which will provide a significant increase in parking opportunities for the Wilson River and Fear and Wilming Trail. And in partnership with Trash No Land, received a grant from the NRA to construct shooting lanes on the San Am Forest. On facilities implementation, we completed installation of a vault toilet at the Cedar Creek OHV staging area and completed construction of the Fear and Loading Trailhead parking area. A few highlights from the non-motorized trails. We completed design work on the 6.2 mile segment of the Wilson River Trail and completed construction of a 2.5 mile segment on the Fear and Loading Gravity Assisted Mountain Bike Trail. And we completed design work for the 40 foot bridge replacement on the Soapstone Lake Trail. On the motorized recreation front, a few of the highlights are completed construction of a three mile trail reroute of the Elk Wallow Trail, complete construction of a half mile additional section to the seven up four wheel drive trail and purchase some new equipment to support maintenance and construction work. And as can be seen from this page, these are just a handful of the items that our recreation staff have been working on. And I encourage everybody to read through these and reach out if there's something of particular interest. Is there any questions on the Recreation summary. Uh, Derek, this is Margaret. Um, I, I have a question just in general that I thought of as you were talking about this. How, how are you dealing with um, 
campers that are not uh, supposed to be out in the forest. Uh, in Columbia County, we have so many trees that uh, we think we don't have people camping, but uh, we know that they're out there and we run into them every so often. So how is the state dealing with that? There's, there's a variety of answers for that. Um, you know, for the most part, what we do, uh, where, where we find them, we go up and inform them that they've passed the, the 14 days. Um, a lot of them move on. Um, sometimes we have the sheriff go up and talk to them as well. A lot of them move on. Um, some of them are kind of repeat offenders that we're kind of constantly chasing around the landscape um, on that. But, uh, but it, it is an ongoing problem. The other problem that we've been having a lot of is uh, people dumping items, uh, RVs, and the like where they, they drop them off and just leave them. And then we have to deal with, with the repercussions of that. Uh, you know, it can range from just having to get rid of the debris to having to have a hazmat team come in because they're full of needles. And, and can you um, uh, talk about those, those we, we have ways of referring to those people, not as, as campers, but um, what, uh, were they short short term resident or long term camping? What there's a there's a term I can't remember now that to refer to somebody who you're you go and chase off every fourteen days. And these are folks who are residing, basically residing in the forest, right? It, yeah, it, it depends. Um, yeah, it's again, it's a wide range. Um, sometimes they are they're they're people that are that are living there. Um, sometimes it's just somebody that's hanging out for an extra long time for, for reasons that I'm, I don't know. Um, and, and probably that's also why there's a range of responses we get when we go up to talk to them is because everybody's story is a little different. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anything else, Margaret, on that, on that line? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. It's just uh, the, I think that, uh, and I can't remember the name of a bill that was passed um, that is going to speak to how one deals with people who need a place to stay uh, on public lands and whether or not we can move them on or not. Uh, and I'm not familiar enough with the details of, of the bill to, uh, to be able to speak to it, but I, I find it uh, concerning. I don't think that that referred to uh, Oregon Department of Forestry or Board of Forestry Managed Lands, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Justin would know, but I think that was, uh, um, was it City of Portland Lands or uh, Portland Parks Lands? Uh, yeah, you've got it right there, Barrett. Uh, it does not apply to state forest lands. Great, thank you. Uh, but currently there's we have a pol policy of a 14 day, 14 day maximum stay, is that, is that right? In one spot? Terrific. Um, well, I'll just, just say, you know, on uh, your table, tables 10 and 11 on the recreation uh, education and interpretation story, there's, there's a lot of activity, um, volunteer and, uh, and other activity going on here and a lot of dollars flowing. Um, uh, pretty impressive numbers for volunteer hours and um, outside revenue. You know, it's, uh, that's a big number um, pretty impressive. All right. Scrolling down. Hey, Derek, before we move on, I had a quick question. Oh, go ahead, Ty. Some input. I just wanted to uh, mention to uh, Margaret, that we do have, you know, the, the issue of abandoning campers uh, out in the forest is, uh, is really becoming um, a big deal up here on the Clatsop. Since 2018, we've spent over $50,000 cleaning up these sites. And I expect that to easily double in the next year or two. Um, right now we have, I think, six 
abandoned RVs that I'm aware of that we're going to have to deal with. And um, the cost of dealing with this, um, you know, per, per site, um, you know, can, can, can range up to a $5,000 per, per RV. So, um, you know, this is an issue that I think definitely needs more notice and discussion because I don't know what the solution is. And I definitely would like to get some help and input on what a solution is. It's something that uh, when I got into this profession, I didn't think we'd have to deal with, but it is becoming uh, a big part of what we do here. Hi, uh, Barrett here. I, I, can't, um, I can't agree more. Um, it is a huge problem and, and a, a, a kind of a hidden cost to the to staff. Um, if, if my hint wasn't clear earlier, I just wanted to um, have everybody orient their mind around this problem. It's, it's not really, it's not part of a recreation um, function or recreation problem. These are kind of public, public use, public access challenges that, um, that um, you know, in the past, sometimes that kind of thing, like dumping dishwashers used to be talked about in as the recreation activity. Um, so just want to just want to uh, make sure we contextualize this the, uh, the right way. Um, I, well, I totally, got, agree, I totally agree with you, Barrett. And, and that's why we've been actually working. We had a work session with Classic County this summer and we're trying to engage um, at that level uh, to come up with some solutions that we can partner on, whether it be staging area for these abandoned RVs where we can have them taken care of in one spot or um, just uh, extra forest deputies out in the woods to try to encourage people not to do, to do this practice. So yeah, no, I agree. It's, these aren't recreationists. These are, you know, long-term type people that have multiple issues um, you know, so. Yep. yep. So connecting with the, these are community-based challenges uh, and community-based solutions. Um, so hopefully we continue to improve the connections between, you know, the department as a, a just a particular place where these problems are surfacing and, uh, and the solutions within the community where they're kind of originating. Um, well, I've got the mic. I wanted to welcome Lisa Phipps. Uh, hi, glad you could make it. And if you want to take a second to introduce yourself, that, that'd be great, uh, Lisa. I'm sorry to put you on the spot if you're away from a, a microphone. Uh, great. Okay. Uh, uh, Commissioner Magruder, I see your, your hand up. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, back on the RV <clears throat> issue. Um, we last night had another abandoned vehicle. This was a car um, along the side of a county road that was burned. So, I mean, it's a hu that's a huge uh, issue for our forests when these folks uh, are out there and I, I don't know whether they get burned because they are just leaving them and burning them or whether they get burned because they're uh, participating in some illicit activity gone wrong uh, that catches it on fire or, or what but we've had multiple vehicles uh, that have burned along our roadways so a huge issue for our, our, our forests. Thank you. You bet. Um, uh, Derek, looks like uh, back to you. All right. So moving on, uh, next page here is, so as is true every year, we have depended on South Fork for a wide variety of tasks, whether it's trail work, ref reforestation efforts, facilities upkeep, or fire assignments, they continue to provide a variety of aid to the department across the year. And the Tillamook Forest Center closed on March 15th, 2020 due to COVID and remains closed. 
This has obviously had a large impact on how they're doing business there. They've shifted over to a virtual environment as much as possible and working on a few larger projects such as the interpretive and educational opportunities resulting from the St. Anne State Forest Restoration and Recovery Project. And with that, this concludes my presentation. If there's any further questions, feel free to ask and I'll see if I can. Well, this is Barrett. Um, again, that uh, South Fork uh, adults in custody crews are such an important resource. Can, can you update us uh, as to the status of the, the, the program? Um, you know, just aware of a moratorium for a while on on the AIC crews working out out in the in the world. What can you tell us? I can take that one if you want, Derek. Okay, yeah. So, as folks are probably aware, um, you know, there was uh, last May there was an escape uh, AIC um, that assaulted. Um, a couple of members of the public there along Highway 6. And so that, that resulted in, in us pausing the crews there for a short time, put some additional precautions uh, in place. The crews went back to work, and now we're in the process of evaluating um, those interim measures to determine how well uh, we're doing there. And so we paused uh, the work out there um, to give us some more time to work with corrections uh, and with our staff on looking at any policy improvements we can make um, to better operationalize these new requirements that we've gotten um, so that we can assure safety of not just the public, but our own personnel um, at a higher level going forward. And so we anticipate um, those crews being back to work um, later this fall. Um, don't have an exact timeline there, but um, we're making good progress. So are, are you in a policy and procedures development phase or are you in a kind of reporting phase on the implementation of some already developed concepts? So we're, uh, yeah, so we're more in the policy and procedure, um, working with corrections and our staff out there um, to refine some of that. So we've got uh, more clear guidance uh, for our crew coordinators and we're better aligned with policies there with, um, uh, uh, South Fork or with uh, corrections as well. So, so do you, um, so do you have some concrete changes that'll affect how they're implemented? Uh, for example, the staff workload or the allocation to certain proximity to the public? Are there changes that we would see that are already have already been kind of set in place? Yeah, I think probably the, the biggest change um, that we would see is probably the ratio or the size of the crews that we would have in areas where we have high concentrations of the public. Hmm. So as we think about, you know, um, uh, in our, our, our designated sites um, where those crews come in contact with the public, we'll probably have smaller crew sizes. So we haven't finalized that work yet, but that's probably one of the yeah. biggest changes um, uh, I would anticipate coming out of the other end of the process. Hey, Ken, I see you've got your, your hand up. Now, this is a, <clears throat> a comment, not a question. Um, Leslie Shaw and I met with Laura and with Kyle Smith uh, a day or two ago, and uh, we had asked Laura to give us some time to talk about REI program in general and specifically some of the um, strategic planning. So I just wanted to thank Kyle and Laura, especially here, for uh, dedicating an hour of their precious time to a good conversation with Leslie and I. So uh, thank you both. Yeah, very good. Very good. Well, we, we've gotten through through the uh, the AOP accomplishment uh, reporting. If uh, anybody on that topic in general have, have thoughts um, from the committee or staff before we leave that uh, agenda item. I, I don't see, without seeing any, we'll, Mike, did you have something? So you come back. Okay. Um, I'll say, you know, we, I'm sure this, 
we just want to do, you know, uh, the chair and staff, we want to do as good a job as we can to make these um, scheduled so that they're easy to attend and we give people plenty of time and we just, uh, sorry, but like, uh, like Ron said, the recent, the change to the schedule from the morning to the evening and or the afternoon. So um, um, thanks for everybody for, for hanging in there and trying to make the change. Um, we'll just continue to try and improve so we can make it easy for folks to attend. So we really have a full room. Um, a full room would be great, wouldn't it? An actual room. Um, okay, um, moving on, if we're ready to do so, um, we're gonna uh, pass it off to Colleen um, to give us an update on the Fern Ridge project. Awesome, thank you, Barrett. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Jason Cox. He's gonna be uh, taking the lead on this one. Uh, sure. So thank Great. you, Jason. Absolutely. Um, so good afternoon. I'm Jason Cox, Public Affairs Specialist for ODF, presenting an update today specifically on public and committee engagement on phase two of the North Cascade Annual Operations Plan for fiscal year 22, focusing on the Fern Ridge Project in the Shelburg Falls Recreation Area on the Sanium State Forest. And I even have a slideshow that I will share. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Great. So I um, want to thank the committee for attending and providing thoughts on this project. And after your special meeting last month, uh, we sent a survey to you and received five responses. Appreciate uh, taking the time to do that, and as well as making the time for the special meeting. And as uh, Barrett said, um, being flexible on the schedule today as well with the special board of forestry meeting. So key themes we heard out of the survey to SFAT. Uh, was the importance of removing hazardous trees that pose a danger to the recreating public, uh, as well as the potential for education and interpretive opportunities. And I do want to caveat that with this is something that would require uh, some additional uh, staff agency capacity of some kind to fully recognize that. But uh, we do see the opportunities that we have here, which leads to the next theme. We heard a lot that this is a real chance to tell a story of balanced forest management that protects environmentally sensitive areas, provides a recreational outlet for the public and generating much needed revenue for communities that are still recovering from the 2020 Labor Day fires. And as well as to help finance the post-fire recovery efforts on the sand end. It's definitely a long-term endeavor. Uh, we also heard enthusiasm for getting the work done and getting this area open again. So the tentative timeline for this project would be to put the project or the contracts, uh, presuming uh, that moves through on up for bid in spring 2022, and would hope to have the work done sometime in the summer. So we don't have a, a definitive date on that area being able to reopen yet. However, um, we don't expect uh, to have the Shelburne Falls area open in time for the summer high use season of 2022. So our engagement to date has been um, working with uh, State Forest Advisory Committee we had a public presentation and Q&A, and questions were mostly around burn severity, activities outside the project area, had some questions on harvest decisions and levels, and got some positive feedback for our approach to this particular area. And uh, yesterday, Kyle Kopp and I uh, accompanied the Statesman Journal newspaper here in Salem uh, on a tour of that area and expect an article to come out soon, and that's just Another way we're trying to get the word out to the public about what our plans are in that area and opportunities to provide comment, which is a uh, decent segue to my next slide. So we'll be uh, putting the phase two plan out for a 30 day public comment period uh, starting Monday. Uh, and that will include a survey on how the agency should go about meeting its social, economic and environmental goals specific to this project. Uh, when the comment period closes, uh, planners will review what we hear and consider adjustments based on that feedback. The final document would then be submitted to the North Cascade District Forester for approval. So again, we expect to open the comment period on Monday, November 1st for 30 days. 
And uh, the public can provide comment via our website, which is oregon.gov slash ODF. And on the website, we'll have links to the public survey and ways to provide written comment. Um, you know, there's e essentially email uh, through the website or uh, via postal mail. Um, and this information will be posted to the Sanium State Forest Recovery and Restoration page on the ODF website as well. So that's the information we have for you. Um, in the time we scheduled for this topic on the agenda, be interested in knowing if you have any additional thoughts on this project. And also want to know if you felt the survey was a useful tool. Um, we plan to try using a version of this survey during the comment period with similar themes, but made some adjustments so that folks could provide some more straightforward feedback rather than all open-ended questions. Um, definitely welcome your feedback on how we could use that tool and if you'd support use of similar tools in the future. Uh, with that, I uh, want to open the floor to questions and feedback. Yeah, Amanda. Yeah, I'll provide some comment on um, the the use of the tool. Um, I I thought that it was fine. It's probably easier for many of the public to use a survey like that rather than just uh, having to provide an open ended comment letter because at least it um, kind of focuses your, your your thought process a little bit. So I thought that was good. The one problem that I have with a tool like that. I think you guys use SurveyMonkey. I can't remember if that was it or not, but the problem is that once you submit, you don't get a receipt of what you submitted. So unless you copy and paste your answers, you don't have a written record of what you submitted. Um, so I don't know if there's a different tool that could be utilized or maybe when you send that out um, with, with public affairs outreach that you let people know that, um, that they, you know, perhaps like what I did is I wrote my comments and also it doesn't do spell check. So, <laughs> so I wrote my comments and then I copy and pasted that into the text boxes. Um, so if there's any way to just clarify that for the public when we get to that period, um, I, that might be useful. Um, so just on, on the tool, I thought that it was easy to, easy to, to use, although um, my comments seem to always be longer than uh, I feel like they are gonna be. Um, so just the copy paste method is probably the easiest. Um, and again, that way you've got a copy of kind of the, the terminology that you utilize to, to reference back to. So um, just some comments on the tool. That's great, thanks. Oh, there you go, Susan, go, go ahead. I thought it was easy to use. I think anybody could have picked it up and and filled it in. Um, I think it's good that people get to use their own words on how they want to express things. So I thought it was good and I think it would be useful. Thanks. Something else. I, I agree. Um, anybody else on that particular question? I don't see any, any hands up. Um, I wonder the the last time um, staff presented on Fern Ridge, we <clears throat> had a sort of a synopsis of the kind of feedback and and uh, controversies that were on the table at the time. What? How do you think things have gone since then, up to date? What uh, any pressure points or um, the sense of um, you know, any way you can characterize the feedback you've gotten from uh, outside SFAC? Um, you know, we haven't, you know, it hasn't been out for comment yet. Um, we're really just, you know, starting with the SFAC meeting last month was the first time we kind of put the concept out into the public mm -hmm. in a real um, significant way. Um, more, more questions today. Um, I suspect I'll be able to give you a much more informed answer to that question um, around December 1st when that comment period closes. Um, so, uh, but others, uh, Ron might, could be having conversations that I'm necessarily, not necessarily there for, but that would be what I've heard. Yeah, I think folks are seeking to understand at this point. We had the public information meeting on Wednesday we had pretty good attendance. I, I felt I was happy. You know, staff put a, some work into making the presentation and, and getting it going. And I, I saw there was around 37 folks that had 
zoomed into the meeting. I know about at least 10 of them were staff. So there was probably in the twenties of externals that were there. A couple of news media outlets were signed in by their, by their name. There wasn't very many questions though. After we gave the presentation, folks just kind of took it in and didn't really have any feedback for it. We weren't asking them necessarily for comments or advice or anything at that point, just informing them of, of what it was, but uh, it was a lot of uh, quietness after they were done with the presentation. So wasn't quite sure how to interpret that, but our intention was to share information and help them understand what we were doing. Uh, go ahead, Susan. Um, I attended a meeting, a meeting of uh, a lot of people from the state last week for the electric co-op world. And I ran into somebody from Salem and we ended up talking about what our meeting was all about this last time. And, and I talked about that, you know, we, a lot of us thought they needed to use that project for education. And it was really surprising to me because she was a pretty, she's pretty tied into the community. She hadn't heard about any of that. She was really impressed with the things that I was sharing with her that state forestry has done in the burned area. Um, and so somehow the information isn't getting to people. So I, I just wanted to make sure you knew that because um, like I said, she's really tied in uh, to the environmental community and um, to what's going on around her. And she just, she had never heard about that. And I was just telling her how impressed I was with all the work that has been done. And um, so I, I don't know what you can do about that, but I was just really surprised that she didn't know anything about all of the work that's being done by state forestry. So I just wanted to share that, that with you. I appreciate that. And uh, expect a little bit more awareness on it, um, perhaps when we open the comment period, but um, certainly with the, when the States and Journal article comes out, um, should help set, shed some light on that project in particular. Yeah, yeah keep, uh, <clears throat> Keep your foot on the gas there, Jason. Uh, I know uh, you only have so much time in the day, but um, from you know my limited contact with with um, with folks, I I sense uh, something similar to the the use of the term, the understanding or misuse of the term clear cut um, from ten or fifteen years ago, where you know in the FMP structure-based management, you know, acres clear cut means a certain thing. And, you know, colloquially in the public mind, clear cut can mean a, another thing. And salvage, the word salvage, um, I, I, I kind of see that as a, a problematic, uh, um, a, a challenge of definition in the public mind and, and in certain information streams. Um, so the more we can uh, disarm that term and bring it back, you know, to a, a more complex um, topic in the general public's mind, the better. Well, that's a great point. And I think particularly when you consider on uh, the post-fire pol harvest policy for ODF, uh, the green tree retention standards that are pretty um, lean towards leaving those on the ground. Um, I'm not the person to ask for details, but I certainly know it goes uh, more above and beyond, not just uh, Forest Practices Act, but the FMP as well. Amanda? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, comment on that really quick. I, I always think that it's important to talk about it like post-fire management, right? And then uh, of course, post-fire post restoration, and that post-fire restoration consists of salvaging material that exists on the ground so that we can help pay for additional restoration activities. Um, but it goes above and beyond that when it comes to, um, you know, unclogging uh, culverts and, uh, you know, restoration of our road systems and, and things like that, too. So I always think that that's a great way to kind of talk about it with the public instead of just for salvaging, um, kind of prefacing that with post-fire restoration. Um, but which you kind of talked about too, Jason. But uh, in addition, I just wanted to raise one thing that I, I talked about in the in the survey 
Um, and again, I'm sorry that I was not here at the last SBAC meeting where we had a more robust conversation about uh, this project. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm fine with this being sort of experimental um, in the way that we're engaging the public and, and going about this treatment around this recreation area. I think we need to be really careful about the metrics that we use to determine um, results from this experiment, right? Um, so is this something that we want to do in the future? How do we measure success? Uh, I've brought that up to some ODF employees in the past. I think that it's just really important for us to be clear around that with, within ODF and then with the public so that expectations um, are not one thing and to one person and something else to somebody else. Um, again, recognizing that this is uh, sort of experimental and not the status quo moving forward. Um, so I think that that's really important. Just wanted to raise that in this meeting. And then also um, with the educational piece, again, I think that it's really important, uh, but I think that we need to talk about the benefits and the negatives from making certain management decisions. So um, for instance, if we're uh, having no cut areas that um, could otherwise have been salvaged and then replanted, what are we giving up um, by not treating those areas or by leaving more than we otherwise would have under a different management scenario? And that's not just for the economics, but also, for instance, climate change. You know, forests that aren't harvested after, after a fire are often, uh, often become net uh, carbon emitters. So um, thinking about decomposition. So anyways, I just think that it's important for us to be really holistic in the messaging and the education that we're providing, um, not just talking about why we made a decision, but what the, what the uh, impacts of those decisions are. Now you made some really great points there. First, I, you know, this, uh, you know, we've gotten to the point where we're able to work on this project because of the road work and the trail recovery work that's already been performed by uh, district staff who, I mean, when you look at the amount of work they've done since uh, since the Labor Day fires, I mean, it's it's beyond impressive. It, and um, to your sec, uh, to your point on um, being able to show the results, um, I think that's a good point. The monitoring that will be taking place um, is going to give us a really good idea. And in fact, you know, it's not there'll be scientific tools to that as well. But um, I was actually standing at a spot where in 20 years, uh, when I was out there yesterday, you'll be able to see the results from a no-touch approach, from an underplant approach, and from a harvest and replant approach. So um, it's going to be really interesting uh, to see how that turns out. And I think you're right. We've got a. It would be good for us to get that uh, information out to folks and find ways to. Uh, show that in, in, a, in a publicly accessible manner. Um, you know, speaking for myself as a non-forester, um, there'll be no, you know, substitution for taking my grandkid up there and seeing what it looks like uh, for myself. Uh, Amanda, can I uh, just, uh, just add to the momentum uh, of your thoughts there? Um, If you're, if you're not describing of this this opportunity is to educate people about exchanges, um, trade offs. Sorry if uh, my audio is cutting out again. Um, exchanges and trade offs, and you know preventing the staff from having to decide, okay, what message should we be talking about here? Is this a, a good news story for this audience? Or the next audience is a good news story I can tell over here. You know, everybody should be getting the full package uh, so that they're really informed citizens about what a greatest permanent value means, what it gives us, what it costs us. Um, it's, it's what they tell us, Oregonians tell us they support every single time we've asked them without uh, exception, and uh, they deserve the kind of story you're, you're describing. Um, while I, again, I'm going to hog uh, my opportunity at the mic, I see that um, Leslie has joined us. Leslie, are you uh, able to introduce yourself? By the way, don't, uh, 
don't apologize as volunteers. You all are, we're all doing the best we can. So um, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I just didn't want you to think I thought, I, it's just been a rough morning. Oh. Okay, so um, Leslie Recreation, happy to hear everything. Uh, that's it. Great, great. Um, Ron, did you have have something to add there other than your your thoughts about our schedule? No. Yeah. Yep. We are we are running a little bit ahead. We have a uh, our next um, next note here is for a break at one forty five. We can we can go ahead and take that break now. We certainly we've been on the phone long enough to to have earned one. Um, so let's let's give ourselves um, we had about a 15 minute break scheduled since we're we're well ahead let's say um, let's come back at uh, 2 210 just uh, if that without an objection yeah. okay great um, Great. Yeah. Well, adjourn for Barrett. a break. Hey, Barry. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I've got one seventeen on my clock right now, so that's an hour break. I think. Did I say two? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a math problem, Barrett. What I meant was uh, about twenty minutes. So thanks for catching that, Ron. So one thirty-five. Closer to closer to one thirty-five. Yeah. 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 That's great. Okay. Sounds thanks. great. Thanks. Good. See you all soon.
I'm seeing sunshine coming in some people's windows, so that's a good a good change. I don't see any hair at my window <laughs> as much as I'd love to. It's coming, I think. I've seen a lot, okay. a lot of windows around the, the rumor oh. having some sunshine come in. I'll cross my fingers, Ron. Okay. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Astoria after about a month of rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the sun came out here in Stilettes here a little bit ago, Ken, so it's heading your way. All you got to do to get a sunny day is to plan a meeting indoors. All right, another uh, another minute or so, and we'll get started again. While we're, while we're waiting um, for, for those who uh, want a fast track to understanding the State Forester um, hiring and uh, uh, selection, it, all that stuff is available. Really, uh, um, a lot of process that's pretty visible. You know, the a lot of the, the interview content on the ODF um, YouTube page. Uh, Really pretty interesting stuff, <clears throat> you know, a level of uh, visibility that, you know, we haven't had in past uh, state forester selections. It's, it's pretty interesting. So if you haven't sat in, in, still in front of your monitor long enough already today, <laughs> take a look. Um, okay, Ron, do you, does it look like uh, Ramona? Yes, Ramona okay. is here. So welcome uh, to everyone back to the meeting. And I'll just go ahead and turn it right over uh, to Ramona. We did introductions earlier, but take a moment to introduce yourself and thank you for being here today, Ramona. Great. Um, I was just chatting with Jason to see if I might be able to be a co-host to share my PowerPoint. Um, my name is Ramona Rechiga. I am the... Um, person that's been assigned to lead the San Diego State Forest Restoration Plan development. And as soon as I can, I'll start sharing my slide. Great. Thank you, Jason. Forgive me, I'm a little bit rusty on this. There we go. All right. Can everyone see? Yes. Terrific. Well, thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon, Chair Brown and SBAC members. Again, my name is Ramona Arechiga, and I've been assigned to coordinate the restoration plan for the San Diego State Forest post-fire. ODF has engaged in a parallel planning process with both plans originating from our post-fire assessment. The first process can be considered our recovery efforts. This planning process is reflected largely in the revised North Cascade District Implementation Plan and the subsequent annual operating plans arising from that implementation plan. The recovery planning process began in the fall of 2020 and is an ongoing effort through fiscal year 2023. Some example activities for our recovery planning include post-fire harvest, road repairs, trail restoration, and addressing our immediate reforestation needs. The second planning process is the development of the restoration framework, which began in earnest in February of this year. At this time, we are starting to wrap up the content development stage 
and the framework will lead to a list of near-term actions to be considered for inclusion in future annual operating plans. For the, and that we see that happening through now, um, from now until the end of the fiscal year 2023 uh, implementation plan for the North Cascade District. Some example activities for uh, we're considering for inclusion in our restoration plan include our aquatic and riparian monitoring protocols. We conducted a bark beetle analysis and subsequent field visits. And we've also designed a small six acre oak replanting project. I want to briefly outline our framework structure. The restoration framework has three parts and provides a living document that will reflect what occurred and how we responded. Part one provides the basis, uh, the, the basic ODF and Sanium State Forest background content and the results of our initial post-fire assessment. Part two utilizes the information gathered through the assessment, as well as the public comments we received during our public engagement process around our revised North Cascade District Implementation Plan. Both the assessment and our public feedback identified some core areas that our ODF specialists research through literature. And this literature review has improved our understanding on how to proceed using best available science for post-fire restoration within the impacted areas of the Sanium State Forest. And to be clear, our focus has been to better understand how to manage in the context of increased disturbance on our landscape. Lastly, part three, we have identified our adaptive management approach and immediate monitoring needs to inform future restoration actions, as well as some immediate near-term activities that would facilitate a broad range of recovery, rehabilitation, and restoration within the Sanium State Forest post-fire. This slide identifies our general restoration pathway in a post-fire environment. Our team of specialists have determined that our focus will critically look at where fire improved, maintained, or degraded ecological conditions, and where those fire effects were outside of desired conditions or our natural range of variation. In the event, ecological processes or ecosystem functions appear to have been compromised in low severity areas, it is likely we would revisit this approach um, and consider those areas for future restorative actions. In addition, we have engaged with a fire scientist to learn more about spatial wildfire planning tool sets to improve our ability to respond to future wildfires that escape initial attack. This tool set will enable us to identify all potential control delineations on the Sanium State Forest to increase our ability to contain future wildfires when they occur. It is likely this analysis will lead to additional management actions along identified high pr priority containment lines. And lastly, our goal is to proactively take advantage of the wildfires creation of biological legacy components. ODF strives to mimic disturbance in our approach to forest management by retaining biological legacies as part of our standard practices. However, in this case, the wildfire did much of the work and has provided us with a bank of biological legacy components. Our restoration framework identifies retaining as much of this legacy as operationally feasible in an effort to accelerate our ability to meet complex structure metrics in the future as well as enhancing stands in our production ground to reflect the natural range of variation that exists in Oregon's west side Douglas fir forests. The flow chart that you see on this slide uh, in front of you is from Meyer et al. 2021. They developed a post-fire restoration framework for national forests in California. And in many ways, when I read this report, it reflects the approach that we've taken here at ODF. 
ODF specialists have engaged in a comprehensive literature review to inform our key priorities for each discipline. We've identified areas where we need to gather more data to take action and developed monitoring protocols and near-term restoration actions. The list of near-term restoration projects are ready for consideration in future annual operating plans. This process will likely occur at regular intervals over the life of the restoration plan and, reflect, and reflects one of the ways we hope to incorporate adaptive management into our approach. Building from the theme of adaptive management, I wanna briefly describe how we are thinking about it. We often hear the phrase, plan, do, learn, when talking about the concept of adaptive management. This figure provides a robust description of how to implement this systematic approach. And it's quite busy. <laughs> what I wanna do is just briefly walk through um, how I think about it which is we need to start with the end in mind. What issues are we trying to solve? And what does success look like? From there, we can identify our goals and quantifiable objectives. And it's important to go through a thorough thought exercise and predict both positive and negative outcomes from actions and activities or, um, that we were contemplating. From here, we can design the action and appropriate monitoring schemes to help us determine if we're achieving our goals and meeting our objectives, and then we can implement and do. From here, we collect the data, analyze it, and determine if the trends show that we're on the right track in meeting our objectives, and then we evaluate if we can improve the process, and then we hopefully will do again. So where are we now and what is next? We've just received feedback from our technical editor within the last 24 hours. So I'll begin the process um, with our team to identify any gaps that that editor uh, identified for us. And then we'll initiate an internal review and revision process. Our steering committee will identify the key stakeholders to solicit feedback from, and we'll begin an engagement process. Finally, we hope to integrate some feedback and finalize a draft for release early next year. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Well, thanks, Ramona. I'm um, looking uh, <coughs> around the room. Um, any thoughts or questions, uh, Amanda? Yeah, I'd be curious. I know that you guys did a lot of um, aerial seating and obviously some uh, manual replanning. Wondering if you guys have gotten any um, surveys done uh, or, or gotten any results from uh, the take of some of those, uh, recognizing we had the big heat dome and many others that had fires uh, have had a lack of um, or had, had quite, a, quite a bit of uh, mortality. Uh, so just wondering how uh, how things are looking on the CNTM. Certainly. Um, at this stage, we haven't implemented our reforestation monitoring protocol. Um, we'll hopefully be looking to acquire some additional funding to support um, the ability to implement that in the near term. So we have a, a question um, I can, um, I think I can adapt. <clears throat> um, are there, are you going to be sharing this, this work um, with uh, other agencies, ODF and W and, and so on um, as, as, as partners? I believe, yes. Um, I believe our steering committee is planning on looking at um, seeing what groups beyond, say, our sister agencies we plan to, to share this with? Yeah, ODF and W is a definite. They're, they're, they're a definite. Um, terrific. Go ahead, Ron. I was just going to, you know, going back to Amanda's question, it's purely anecdotal. There's no scientific study behind it or not. But I went out for a day with uh, John Walter, uh, Ramona's, you know, counterpart on our Youngstown Civil Culture team, and we 
just randomly, you know, walked around in the woods where we had aerial seeded looking for seedlings. And we did find them of the varying species of seed that we put out. Uh, so they're there and it's, you know, there's a lot of variability. And we even went to some areas that were on private land adjacent to where the aerial seeding occurred, um, you know, that hadn't had any treatment. And we also found uh, seedlings there. So <laughs> there, there's, there's trees growing back out there for sure. Yeah, that's good to hear, even anecdotal. <laughs> I've got pictures of little trees. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Ramona. Um, let's see. We're still, we're a ways ahead, but do you think um, Sarah is uh, available? Yeah, we've had a, a change and Mike Wilson is here with us oh, today and he's going to, Sarah's had something come up uh, personal where she's not available to make it and Mike Wilson's filling in uh, for this agenda item. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Brown, members, of the, uh, again, I'm Mike Wilson. I'm the uh, Deputy Division Chief of Policy uh, here in the State Forest Program, and I will uh, be presenting today, uh, give you a little bit of an overview of, let's see if I can get my presentation mode up correctly here. Okay, hopefully everybody's seeing the, the presentation mode of the PowerPoint. Okay, yes. great. Mm -hmm. Super. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to give you a little bit of an update today on the FMP and the HCP uh, for Western Oregon State Forests. Uh, so, uh, and it'll mostly be about the FMP, um, really with a little bit of timeline stuff uh, on the HCP. A little, I guess, a little bit about some of the revisions we've been making to our administrative draft. So uh, for context, uh, I think you all have seen this before, but just a refresher, these are for the lands uh, that we manage on the west side, uh, west of the crest of the Cascades. Uh, so it's about 614,000 acres of Board of Forestry lands and about 26,000 acres of common school forest lands. So uh, talk a minute about our engagement process thus far uh, with the FMP. Um, and the, it's uh, similar to the HCP. We're trying to have a robust process and reach out and make sure that we get um, uh, opinions uh, and input from people ahead of time. Um, you know, the FMP will go through a rulemaking process at the end of the day uh, because it is adopted as rule uh, per our planning rules. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of this presentation. But um, essentially, we want to make sure we do a good job of internal drafting and review. So we do a lot of review uh, with our state partner agencies, uh, also, uh, in, as well as our internal folks and our own operational reviews. Then we release the draft content. Uh, so far, that's been the draft goals um, to the Board of Forestry, Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee, and the State Forest Advisory Committee, and the public. And then we engage in meetings open to the public, uh, as well as specific stakeholder meetings and FTLAC meetings. Um, so along the way, we gather quite a bit of feedback. And then where we're at now with the draft goals is we will be bringing uh, a summary, both the draft goals and a summary of the input that we've received so far, as well as a few partial revisions to those draft goals to the board uh, next week right, at the November 3rd meeting. Now, I, I wanna say, uh, I wanna be really uh, clear about this. We're not asking them to approve the goals. We are bringing them draft goals and the feedback we've received so far so that they can consider that, give us some more feedback. And it's very much a live process all the way to the point where we actually drop a draft FMP. Uh, uh, on them, you know, a, a more complete draft. But we want to be getting the information as we go along. If, if we develop something in isolation and then it drops and nobody's happy with it, that doesn't serve us very well. So we do want to make sure that we're um, getting that input along the way and not, not locking anything down uh, until, it's, until it's time. Uh, 
Another piece of this is there will be modeling associated with the forest management plan uh, to understand the outcomes. And so we know full well that nobody's gonna buy off uh, on a full draft plan without seeing some likely outcomes from that plan as well. So um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. Uh, there will be a little bit more uh, narrative detail on this uh, during the board meeting, um, if you'd like to tune into that. But <clears throat> basically what I take away, or what we, we put out a informal survey uh, and completely you know, not randomly selected folks, it's whoever chose to participate. Uh, we got a pretty good cross-section of people um, of about 54 to 52 respondents, depending on the question. Um, but basically uh, what I take away from this slide is we had 80% of folks that strongly supported or somewhat supported most of our goals, whether they were the high level goals around climate change, forest health and wildfire, or whether they were some of the more specific resource goals. Um, and on this slide, just so you know, and it might be a little distracting, what's highlighted in yellow are actually uh, resources that are required to have goals and be addressed in the forest management plan uh, per, the, per the planning rules. Moving on, there was about 70% uh, for four goals. We had about 70% uh, that strongly supported or somewhat supported, 60% uh, uh, for a couple of uh, goals. And then really the only goal that people didn't care for was the mining agriculture administrative sites and gra grazing, which is essentially like, yeah, as it is compatible with other forest uses. Um, and I think that's just kind of a, a bit of a misunderstanding uh, for a lot of folks, but again, the, the reason that's in there is because it is required that we address that. So our upcoming key dates, um, we're going to be rolling out uh, other than after the November 3rd board meeting where we'll be presenting uh, some of the draft strategy summary uh, summaries. It is the uh, rolling out, uh, sorry, draft goals. Um, after that, we'll be rolling out the draft strategy. So on November 24th, I believe, is the target date for us to release draft strategies to uh, the Board of Forestry, FTLAC, you folks, and also just the uh, general public. Um, although sometimes our public release might be a day or two later uh, than, than to you all. Um, <clears throat> on December 3rd, we plan to engage with the Forest Land Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee to get some of their feedback on the draft strategies. Um, December 7th, we will be having a, a meeting open to the public. And then two joint stakeholder meetings are planned, one on December 9th, one on the 13th, uh, to get more feedback. And we won't actually be bringing those draft strategies to the board uh, until March of 2022. Um, there's a number of timing issues in there that creates a little bit more of a delay uh, for us. Um, so that's, that's, uh, these are the next key dates for rolling out those draft strategies, which are the next uh, component. So I'll switch now to some HCP updates. Uh, again, at the November 3rd uh, board meeting, uh, this will be presented in a lot more detail um, or some, somewhat more detail. Um, so we have conducted an operational review uh, internally of the HCP. And the, the reason that we needed to do that was to make sure that we had clarity for implementation so that our staff know exactly how they're gonna be uh, implementing the HCP or what those sideboards are for implementing the HCP on the ground. And also to get consistency across the document. Uh, as you all know, it's a very thick document and uh, we wanted to make sure we said the same thing in the same uh, places. <clears throat> so that was a, a review that really helped us um, uh, uh, quite a lot, actually, uh, internally. And I give a big shout out here to uh, Derek Baines. He led that review for us uh, internally and did uh, an absolutely great job of categorizing the feedback um, and helping us move through that process and um, make appropriate edits. So uh, big thanks to him. Um, 
some of the things that we'll have uh, in that we have updated in the administrative draft of the HCP um, are updates to some of the covered activities. Most of that is fairly descriptive uh, and clarifying language. Um, however, we have removed uh, the use of herbicides as a covered activity under the HCP. We've had some uh, updates to conservation actions as well, um, and largely those hinge on uh, clarifications around retention standards, so green trees, downed wood, um, and snags, those retention standards, uh, which really apply mostly outside of habitat conservation areas on the, on the general landscape. And then some clarity around seasonal operating restrictions, both inside of habitat conservation areas and outside of them. Uh, in addition to that, a big piece of work right now, big shout out to Laura and her team, uh, to Randy Peterson and Jamal, uh, if they're on the, on the call here. Um, they did a really, they're doing a really good job of assembling our recreation BMPs so that we can uh, get those uh, aligned, uh, so that we can get them in the F, uh, HCP and make sure that uh, we know what those standards are uh, going forward. So I'd like to uh, present the timeline here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, present the timeline for um, the both the HCP and the FNP process. Um, and I'll go ahead and start at the top. So uh, we have an administrative draft in, uh, you know, that we released back in at the end of March. And it has not changed publicly uh, at this point. We are in the process of making revisions to that. That is the basis for the draft. Oops, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, for the draft EIS that is underway. Uh, we expect that uh, draft EIS to come out at the end of January, at which time we'll also be uh, taking all these edits that we've done and rolling them up into what's called the public comment draft uh, for the HCP. And either at or maybe slightly before the release of the draft EIS, we will be uh, submitting an application for the incidental take permits uh, that are required. And as part of that, submitting the public comment draft of the HCP. And that begins a public comment process, uh, which is at least 45 days, I believe, and can be 60 days um, <clears throat> to get public comments on both the draft EIS and the uh, public comment draft of the HCP. And once we have those, we'll move into finalizing uh, and completing the, uh, the HCP, um, which involves also completing the final uh, environmental impact statement. Uh, the culmination of which is a public, uh, publishing the record of decision uh, around that uh, EIS. For the FMP development, we are currently in this phase. Uh, we've already gone through initiation and planning. We have our internal teams assembled. Obviously, we've been doing uh, work developing the FMP content. Um, down here in November of 2021, we had the engagement point with the Board of Forestry uh, uh, around the draft goals. Um, and also at all these points, there's some kind of an HCP update as well. And then, as I mentioned earlier, next March, we will be taking the draft strategies uh, to the board. Follow closely in April, uh, we hope, with a, a summary of the draft EIS um, for the HCP. And then in June, uh, we plan to have the first complete draft of the forest management plan complete. And that involve, that includes the goals and the strategies, but also guidelines for implementation, asset management, and adaptive management uh, as well. So we'll be bringing that in June along with modeled outcomes uh, so that we can understand what the uh, combination of the FMP and HCP uh, will produce um, for a variety of uh, metrics. And then we'll receive feedback there from the board uh, move through the summer, and then our target is uh, still to bring a final draft FMP uh, to the board in sep 
uh, September of 2022, so that we can enter into rulemaking uh, and then have a final um, uh, FMP uh, at the end of at the end of rulemaking. So once once that process happens and the board makes the finding that the FMP achieves GPV and then adopts it formally as its own OAR. With that, I'd like to also uh, sort of uh, roll out an idea uh, that was been under consideration, and um, we would like to consider the option or the idea of using SFAC as a rules advisory committee as part of the rulemaking process. Um, that rules advisory committee would be a facilitated process um, and it would take some additional time commitment, uh, likely in the fall. Uh, according to this schedule here, it would be in the fall to early winter of next year. And so if, uh, if folks here were interested, if SFAC was uh, interested in, in serving in that capacity, uh, we could bring that back early next year uh, with some more framing of, of what it would uh, uh, really entail. Um, so I guess the question uh, that's sort of out there is, is how this uh, group might feel about working with a facilitator to, to frame this up and bring it back with a more deliberate and discreet uh, uh, work associated with, uh, with the rules of potential rules of vice group, advisory committee. Can I uh, have you, Mike, um, describe um, if, if SFAC did not exist or, you know, if you hadn't thought of this, um, what does that mean for rulemaking? You know, what, what, what would you go through if we weren't available to do this work, in other words? Sure. So um, rules advisory committees are not necessarily mandatory. Um, is my understanding, but they can be very helpful in the process. And so if you don't already have uh, an existing group, and I would say oftentimes I would think probably for most processes, uh, there is not an existing group, then there's some sort of outreach to uh, assemble uh, a group of folks to do that work. And, you know, maybe I can also just go ahead and get Justin uh, on the hook here a little bit, he can he can give us sort of a high level idea of what that entails. And I'll stop sharing so that you can. Sure, yeah. So uh, rules advisory committee, as, as Mike said, they're not strictly required, but it is under the Administrative Procedures Act, the policy of the state of Oregon to uh, try to solicit feedback to the maximum extent possible and to do that before you begin rulemaking. So that would, you know, consistent with what we're trying to accomplish here be our goals to get feedback before we go into rulemaking, which um, can be an abbreviated process with just, you know, some hearings for public comment and um, a public comment period to, to submit written comments. This would be more of a, uh, an opportunity to engage uh, and get that wide range of uh, feedback from people who are uh, you know very close to the process to begin with uh, a lot of the times and i think for sfac specifically uh with the the mission that you have in terms of providing feedback on the implementation of the plan um, having the opportunity to look under the hood a little bit um, and and look forward to what the plan would look like as it's being implemented and provide feedback um, is is uh, mutually beneficial uh, to both you know us as uh, the division and and you all as uh, the advisory committee. So, um, in terms of what's required, um, if we convene a rules advisory committee, the advisory committee does have to um, provide some fiscal impact recommendations. So, whether the the plan is expected to have um, fiscal impacts and what those look like, and also specifically on small businesses, uh, what that would look like. Um, so there's a little bit of, of additional work that goes into uh, uh, the, the effort, not only policy, but have to kind of think about the, the, the economics of it as well, or the, the financials um, as well. Um, and yeah, I think we'd be, you know, looking at, um, 
you know, a handful of facilitated meetings to, to really dig into the contents of the, the plan and try to get those, um, you know, as, as improved and robust as we can before we initiate the rulemaking process. So that uh, brings up a couple, a couple points. <clears throat> the, the department could augment the committee on a kind of an ad hoc basis <clears throat> for this process. Um, you know, where we were, uh, where we were short or where we needed the, whether it's the, the economic impact piece or uh, in other ways that that's certainly possible. Yes, um, I'm not sure if uh, committee members, committee members caught uh, what Justin was saying there is, you know, this committee will be advising on implementation of that next plan. So our work on the advisory side of, in, in rulemaking will really give everybody on the committee a head start for, you know, providing the most uh, useful, in, you know, feedback right from the start. And so I, I think just being involved on the front end here would help us all be a little more effective committee members, I, I expect. Um, any, any thoughts about the workload, folks? Or uh, I see Lisa, Lisa, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering, I, well, one, I think that this group lends itself well to that, whether it's this advisory committee specifically, or you're pulling folks from this advisory committee to a rulemaking uh, advisory committee, but would you also open it up and allow for other interested parties to participate or how do you ensure that that, that can happen? So um, our meetings are generally public, for example, would these be public meetings where people could come and provide added input, that type of Yeah, um, so uh, a couple of things. The, the public engagement aspect of, of rulemaking, um, it, you know, it, it's open to, to the everybody that wants to, to weigh in um, uh, once, once the public comment period is open. Anyone can provide written comment. Anyone can attend hearings and provide uh, oral comment there as well. So this would be, you know, an additional step ahead of that, um, really wanting to focus in on uh, not so much getting a, a lot of people uh, weighing in, but a, enough people weighing in that represent the people who are likely to be affected by the rule. And with greatest permanent value, we're talking about the state of Oregon and really, you know, social, economic and environmental uh, aspects of that management. So, uh, so that's where this, this group really lends itself well. Um, it, you know, you, you represent a cross section of interests, uh, cross section of locations um, across the state, uh, cross section of um, expertise and um, skills. So uh, we would be looking for um, a, a group that, that we can facilitate through that uh, rules advisory process that represents the, the breadth and the cross section really of, of Oregon uh, so that we can then go into rulemaking and have that wide open to the public at large. Uh, would it be possible to, uh, so we avoid <clears throat> having to modify our charter to, to have any kind of uh, augmented membership or specialized uh, input be we just called ex officio for a uh, um, specific period? Um, or would that also require modification of the charter even to add an ex officio? So I, I don't think we have to necessarily characterize this as an SFAC meeting. I see. Um, we, can, we can invite all of SFAC, and as you mentioned earlier, maybe there's an augmentation that's needed as well. We, you know, we get a handful of other people, um, and then that group becomes the Rules Advisory Committee, and it would really um, be oriented that way. Mm -hmm. um, 
as a as a rules advisory committee rather than another you know sort of SFAC meeting uh, where we wouldn't have to to go through that effort of sort of modifying your charter and um, you know, stepping on toes that way. But I see Andy has his hand up and uh, maybe he has additional thoughts. So I'll let you weigh in there, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Justin. And and we do have that flexibility with the existing charter. Um, if we need to bring in some expertise for a given topic on a meeting, um, we've always had the latitude to do that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a mind bender, you know, when we start talking about a rules advisory committee, but if folks have you know, look at some of the processes we've gone through as an agency over the last four or five years, or maybe even two or three years when we looked at um, uh, the salmon steelhead and bull trout rules. Um, there was a big rulemaking process there. And, and the group that they utilized was those regional forest practices advisory committees. Because again, it was, it was an existing group that was there that understood uh, the existing rules and would also be the entities that would be uh, affected by some of those rules. And so that group was utilized. A different effort is when they, um, the department um, revised the smoke management rules and, and we didn't have a standing um, advisory group there. And so we built a very broad uh, a group of folks across multiple agencies, members of the public, uh, various stakeholders um, to provide input on those rules. And, and those are probably more uh, metric driven than kind of what we're talking about here, but it is still a rulemaking process. And so I think the, uh, I think it's easy to tumble to SFAC for the reasons Justin just mentioned as an entity that could help us get that initial cut um, done, if, as I understand it, um, that would then be presented to the, the broader uh, public base. Am I right on that, Justin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Looks thanks like. for th thanks for your uh, input, Leslie, who uh, mentions uh, she thinks it's a great idea. Um, yeah, um, we don't want to get any group group think uh, momentum going here. If there's any any concerns or pushback, uh, boy, please please share them, folks. Uh, it, Looks like Mike Kennedy's got his hand up there. Oh, Mike, sorry. Yeah, it just um, it seems like a good idea to make use of this um, group for sure. Um, I'm just curious as to what kind of uh, time commitments it would be. You know, how often do those groups, uh, uh, advisory groups, usually meet, um, and how many times would we, uh, you know, be committing to? Yeah, that's. Um... A great question, a very valid one, and perhaps the most important one. Um, and the answer is it depends. So it's a, um, we're, we're talking about a very big rule, very long, lots of content. Um, I think, you know, as uh, we get ready to, to go into that rules advisory committee process, we, it would be incumbent on us to try to summarize as much of that information as possible and, and try to uh, focus in on the the meaty parts of the plan, the goals, the strategies, et cetera. Um, but, but there's still a lot of content there. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're really looking at the, the entirety of the rule and getting feedback on that, the entirety of, of the rule uh, to the extent that it, uh, uh, that we need advice on, on the whole thing before we go into rulemaking on that. And, and certainly we have to have enough of an understanding to be able to weigh in on the, the fiscal impacts, which is a requirement of um, something that the committee has to weigh in on. So um, I think it's safe to say that, um, you know, a, a few meetings, probably minimum, and, um, you know, expect that those are, um, you know, a few hours each uh, would, would not be unreasonable. Um, but I think it's also up to this group to decide um, in part, you know, as the rules advisory committee is coming together, uh, we'll have to, as the department and the division, figure out what it is exactly we need in terms of advice um, as sort of a floor 
and then that that committee will um, uh, be able to provide some feedback, I think, as well as, you know, here's here are the things that we really want to to weigh in on and and can can weigh in on. Um, and again, we'd be looking at a facilitated process to really try to get through that um, cleanly and easily. Uh, and I see Mike has his hand up. Here, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, like Justin said, it, it, you know, it's going to be incumbent uh, upon us to uh, bring summarized information, but also with the rule this complex, um, you know, it's, this is why one of the reasons why we're having uh, this kind of engagement up front. And we really want to, you know, roll the plan out as we develop it and then also have that set of modeling out. So I think probably one of the things that uh, the rack for uh, for that rule would have that a lot of them don't is a really robust set of uh, information to uh, help really focus uh, input. Uh, thanks, uh, Lisa, for your comments in chat. Um, Yeah, I think. Uh, what are you? Um, what are you hearing um, <clears throat> on this, uh, Mike or or Ron? And uh, what do you think we need you know, to consider for, next? So for me, part of this was the gut check, you know, with you all, just to find out if there was uh, an interest in us further developing the concept to explore those things around, you know, the framework, uh, what the participation would be, you know, if it would be an SVAC. Rules Advisory Committee or SFAC would be part of a augmented rules you know, advisory committee. But that's where we were at today was really wanting to introduce the idea, get some initial, you know, gut level, uh, you know, feedback on uh, interest and uh, try and frame up what we could around the, the time commitment, what was known, you know, when it would occur and just kind of roughly there. And then we will take that now and maybe look for, for Barrett to, to help us along um, with a facilitator and our staff and better frame up that to bring to you all at the, the next meeting, uh, you know, a, a better developed framework of what that might look like. But this was just an initial check-in to see, uh, should we spend the energy to, to frame it up with SFAC as a primary component of that committee? And I'll turn it over to Mike too, if he's got any thoughts, if I missed anything there, or, or Andy. Mike first, Wilson. No, I, I, I didn't have any, um... I didn't really have anything to add to that, Ron. I just, I noticed Amanda had her hand up. And I also just wanted to remind people that when we're kind of closed on this discussion uh, piece of it, that uh, if anybody had questions on the HCP or FMP update uh, items themselves, I'd be happy to answer those. Sorry, but Andy, before we go to Amanda, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, I, well, yeah, I guess I just reiterate what you said there, Ron. It was, as opposed to laying out the plan today, it just wanted to get a sense that, um, make sure that nobody was flinching when we brought up the concept of, you know, um, you know, this group or portions of this group functioning uh, as a rule advisory committee. And then just, and it sounds like there is interest and willingness. So then that gives us um, kind of the green light to kind of frame up what that would look like and bring that back. Uh, to this group at a meeting, you know, probably early, um, you know, well, in uh, sometime next year. So we'd have uh, more flesh um, uh, on the bones there for folks to better understand what uh, it actually means if we say this group would function um, as a rule advisory committee. Great, uh, Amanda. Yeah, thanks Chair Brown. Um, I just want to clarify that um, there would be opportunities for, for others to be suggested to be on this rack. Obviously, there is a lot of expertise and people that have been heavily engaged in the process that I think would appreciate the opportunity to be on the rack in addition to, to folks from, from the SFAC. Um, so just want to point that out. And then as far as scheduling, obviously, there are many other rule advisory committees underway right now that ODF is engaging in, of which those that have been heavily in, involved with the FMP, uh, such as myself, are also on. 
So uh, there could be some scheduling conflicts there. So just want to note that um, there's just a lot going on with, with ODF, which provides a lot of great opportunity. I think we're at a um, we're at an inflection point here, uh, which is which is great. You know, I'm really happy about that. But just want to recognize the scheduling conflicts uh, that already exist within uh, within the department. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for your your comment, Ken, in in chat. Um, all right, um, I think you maybe you've gotten the first. Uh, First glimpse of that you were after, Ron, Mike. Um, let's see where where it, we end up. By any questions? Going back to Mike. Sorry, Bert, to interrupt, but Mike had offered a pause here to see if there were any questions on the FMP HCP timeline process. We kind of jumped right into this before Tom Scoggins. Yeah, yeah, Mike. Uh, I have. My most concern is over the HCP and whether it really reflects uh, the input of the field foresters. Uh, I went, I spent a day in the woods with one of our ODF foresters last June and looking, just looking at the operations. As most of you know, I had 34 years in, in this district with ODF, so I know the land pretty well. Uh, and I, my concern is that at least at the time, there wasn't very much input by the field foresters into the uh, areas being chosen to be set aside for wildlife. Uh, when I read the document, the, not the most recent one, but the one that was put out about a year ago that was like 150 pages, I did have a favorable view of uh, the advantages to the department of, of having the HCP in, in not having to survey all the time and not uh, being subject to uh, court challenges and all this kind of thing. But the devil's in the details. And I just think it's really important that we have our field foresters be able to give input about what areas were chosen. And I didn't see that at the time when I, last June, and maybe things have changed since then. Yeah, so there were, uh, thanks Tom, and there were uh, certainly, uh, there are certain considerations around the habitat conservation areas, which are the primary uh, thing you're talking about um, during, that, um, during that process. And so a lot of it was driven by species and species habitat, given the fact that that's what it's for. Uh, we did go through a couple of different iterations, high level, policy level, uh, operational, I guess I call it more po policy level operational reviews with the field um, uh, last uh, uh, summer before last, um, <clears throat> went through and identified areas to try and strike uh, a little bit more of a balance uh, between operationally uh, uh, areas that they would like to see have operational flexibility still versus, uh, versus being in HCAs. And we made some adjustments there. Um, then we also went through a process whereby uh, they, again, Derek helped uh, lead this process, which was really helpful for us. Um, basically, <clears throat> uh, refining a lot of the boundaries of the uh, habitat conservation areas to reflect, um, basically make, make sensible operational boundaries out of them uh, and also make some minor choices there um, around operability um, that didn't really make a whole lot of difference. The net, I would say, stayed the same at that point. And then this operational review was really more about the implementation and, you know, is this understandable? Can it be implemented? And, and what does that require? Um, certainly there's a policy level uh, decision uh, in this whole thing that, um, you know, we, that as a division, we make that policy level decision. Uh, uh, decision, but not everybody is necessarily going to be on board with all aspects of it uh, across our staff. But but we did try to provide uh, those opportunities for operational input at different levels along the way. Um, I think some parts of it are a little, um, they're different than how we normally build our plans, which we have a history of building them from the ground up uh, very much. And this one was a little different, largely because of timelines and other things where it was built, um, certain aspects of it are certainly a little bit more top down. 
uh, in, in terms of the policy uh, and how it was uh, how it was put down. So anyway, uh, thanks. Uh, Mike. Yeah, a question for you. I noticed um, you mentioned that you had dropped the uh, herbicide application from the HCP. I assume that doesn't mean that you're dropping use of herbicides totally from um, state forest uh, application out there. Um, but what what would your plans be for the future as far as um, making sure that you were covered covered all your bases as far as the herbicides? And, and why did you choose to pull it from the HCP? Sure. Sure, yeah, that's absolutely correct. We are still going to use herbicides. Um, and as a point of clarity for folks, um, we actually were not ever going to be covering all herbicide use. Um, we were covering specifically ground-based application um, because then we could we could actually come up with conservation strategies whereby we could implement it uh, in a certain way. Um, the aerial application uh, never really made it into the conversation because of a lot of the issues around the ability to control application with a fine enough scale to deal with some of the covered species. Um, and a principal one, we, we've never really been terribly worried about the aquatics. Given the size of the riparian conservation areas, those buffers um, and how they're applied under the HCP, that wasn't really too much of a concern for us. Um, there was some discussion with Noah about what that looks like, and it was we never got to a point of final clarity anyway with that. But uh, for something like the Oregon slender salamanders, <clears throat> you know, we could come up with a ground-based application strategy that would still allow us to be cautious of where they would still exist in recent harvest units, um, so as to minimize the effects on them, for instance. Um, however, for other species, even with a ground-based application, uh, that was not really something that we were able to do. And it's, it's kind of an interesting nexus. Um, in order for something to be a covered activity, you have to know that it has the potential to take one of the covered species, one or more of the covered species, and then you have to establish those pathways uh, of take. And then you can come up with the minimization and mitigation measures associated with that. So the fact of the matter is a lot of those data uh, don't exist to support that. And it was beginning to look like a very lengthy, uh, complex process to establish those things in such a way that we would then be able to say, okay, uh, now we can come up with, with the strategies to address that. And that was a huge part of that decision. There's also a part of it of, um, you know, when we look at the HCP, it was one, it was something that was becoming more prescriptive and in terms of the list of chemicals to be used and certain buffer distances at which they would be applied. Um, and they weren't really fitting for us. And one of the ways that they weren't fitting was we wanna be able to use the newer, safer, chemicals as they come online and, and know that we can in a timely fashion. And it just wasn't clear that we we're gonna be able to iron out that process. Like, you know, how does that work under the HCP? Um, and so that was a big factor in the decision. Uh, knowing that we still had the FNP, IP, AOP process, um, all of which have points of uh, public input to, um, to help with that, uh, you know, we feel pretty, we feel comfortable that we can still receive input and respond to input in a responsible way, even if it's not a covered activity under our HCP. So we have that other process, which is, uh, which is good. And then as a final note, I'd just say, um, you know, really with, uh, we are open to amending the HCP at some point in the future. Um, if the services uh, are able to come up with, you know, the sort of the, the mechanisms by which you can have that flexibility and that ability to change uh, fairly, uh, it, it, to be nimble in, in how you apply chemicals and the BMPs um, as, as, uh, as they become available. Mike, did you have a comment? Uh... 
Mike, I guess uh, Mike McKibben, sorry, I just saw you came off off mute. I thought you had something. Uh, just, thanks no, not really. I mean, I would echo Tom's concerns there. I, I deal with a lot of the um, admin level guys over here at the department. And it seems like there's a bit of a disconnect between, you know, what, what the HP, HCPs, what we're telling people this thing is going to do, or at least to this point in Salem and what they think can actually happen on the ground. Um, you know, if you look at the Tillamook district, just in particular, where I think the HCA areas cover over a hundred thousand acres of the forest and, um, which I think is roughly 40%. Maybe somebody can tell me if my numbers are wrong there, but it, you know, when you overlay that on top of the ground and then ask these guys to go out and get the same amount of volume that they have in the past or more in some cases, they're scratching their heads. And so I just think that um, I hope that there's kind of some touch more touch points with them to make sure that, that these things can actually happen. So some of the same concerns you're hearing, Tom, I think are the things I'm hearing. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and certainly that is the way forward through that is we will be doing more extensive modeling um, over the winter. <clears throat> That's part of what we plan to bring to the board in June is that package of outcomes. And so what that will be specifically is the FNP with the HCP overlay, right? And so the draft FNP with the HCP overlay and what the outputs are uh, of that. As part of that modeling, uh, this is gonna be much more, uh, much better resolution of modeling, um, both temporally and spatially, uh, than we were able to do for the, uh, for the HCP, for the comparative analysis modeling. And so, um, and the, these models go through a master a model solution review, sorry, uh, that the districts all look at and say, okay, does that, and that is the key question uh, there is like, he, here we have these outcomes, they look great. Do we really have uh, confidence that we can implement them? And so that's really a critical point at which we get a lot of feedback uh, as well on that. And that's something they're fairly used to for previous modeling efforts. We have gone through that, uh, most notably the H&H &H modeling, uh, but then also sort of the follow-up to H&H, &H, basically the same modeling with different, uh, uh, some different spatial constraints for the species of concern modeling we did for the plan revision in uh, 2010. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just uh, concerned that we get so far down the road uh, with, without having enough input from the field people that are actually going to have to do the work uh, on where things are chosen, that it's going to be too far down the road to turn back and, and change it. So I think uh, we want to, my, from my perspective, we want to be involving people now before it gets too far away or for, far down the road on the process. Can I ask, um, <clears throat> is it possible that the, um, <clears throat> the landscape level considerations and the kind of cross, <clears throat> cross, cross district um, fact, planning factors are, would be opaque to folks at the, at the district level, but, you know, potentially, you know, at the district level in the county, things may look one way on a, on a landscape planning level and possible kind of cross district uh, management might look different. That is part of the, that is part of the change uh, here for sure. Uh, one of, you know, the HCP modeling that it's been done so far, uh, not only is it not quite at the spatial resolution in terms of hardest units as the districts are accustomed to, but it does have Everything was modeled at three large sub-geographic levels uh, with the HCP. There was the North Coast, the Willamette Valley uh, districts, and then so Southwest uh, Oregon. And so uh, the flow of timber was not controlled within that uh, uh, scenario. 
And so, you know, there's the questions there about how does that really play out? So as part of the FMP modeling, we're not changing the policy overlay of the HCP, uh, but we are changing, uh, we are considering different timings and flow of timber, uh, you know, specifically uh, across, across those uh, geographic areas. So, so we can understand the Delta and the impacts to counties and also our own operations. Um, and we are working with Mason, Bruce and Gerard. Uh, we're working with Mark Rasmussen uh, to try and develop what those scenarios should look like. Uh, we don't want to have too many of them, you know, just for sake of getting the work done, but we do want to have enough to adequately uh, be able to assess kind of the Delta between this large area unconstrained versus trying to produce outputs at a finer scale across as well. Well, a quick uh, clarification uh, on your example uh, that you described uh, with regard to herbicides. You you described some some uh, background discussions and analysis, and said, you know, we decided not to include that. By we, you, do you mean the scoping team, or what do you mean by we? So ultimately, that's an ODF decision. Um, you know, the discussion in the scoping team was really looking at the feasibility of actually being able to get uh, get there uh, with the. Uh, um, but uh, so we didn't, uh, but, but the scoping team, the services were not part of the ultimate decision on whether or not we were going to include it. That was an ODF decision. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't want to <clears throat> keep take my eye off the no hands raised. I see uh, we're getting near the end here, but I'll. Um, Pose a question I had about the question slash comment about the recreation BMPs. Um, uh, you know that's a, that was a pretty unusual and unexpected um, kind of point of inquiry. Um, the uh, the process to date from the very beginning. <clears throat> um, you know I, I was involved pretty intimately with the entire entire team where the kind of the scope of um, analysis was was uh, defined and described we uh, had uh, lots and lots of meetings with um, folks at all levels and um, those of us engaged from the recreation stakeholder communities um, pressed and, and explored and, and we got sample large public land HCPs out in front of us and came to appreciate just where we were headed. We left those processes over the last two years going out to our communities, explaining what the HCP meant for recreation, very specific about facilities and you know, trailheads and the kind of things that would be covered activities. And it, it appears because of some turnover in staff from, from fisheries that this whole thing was, was cracked open again for for uh, review and I'm, I bring this up for we don't advise the HC on the HCP process I'm sorry um, so it's not uh, SFAC's role thankfully we wouldn't get anything wouldn't have got anything done if it had been but um, there I, I can't find um, you know a lot of people have complaints about some of the outcomes um, this is not a complaint about the outcome. I, I think the fisheries staff and I are in perfect alignment about what, for example, should the RMA be a off highway vehicle playground? You know, you know, should should there uh, we're in alignment on values? But <clears throat> I don't find justification for this in process terms anywhere. I look um, staff if this had been. Um, kind of the orientation of the um, scoping team and the fisheries, for example, um, staff and stakeholders could have engaged and uh, worked on product that would really belong in a 70-year plan. Um, 
with this coming up just you know four weeks ago or or six weeks ago um it really does not serve the public because we're we're left to try and just evaluate the questions the challenges and the the kind of language that would belong in an hcp um and furthermore that they they were unable to establish pathways of take because they don't as you described it mike uh they there are hypothetical pathways of take you know hypothetically a, a trail might um be able to lead to uh, adverse impacts but they aren't by definition de minimis in the same way we we work to Make sure that uh, human waste isn't a problem around our campgrounds. Everybody can understand that. Those are uh, well understood impacts. But we don't require folks in a uh, logging operation to bring an outhouse out to their landing because the impacts are de minimis. We, we, we know that they, the impacts, the trade offs are not uh, you know, commensurate with what we can measure for impact and so very long way of saying i'm just really concerned that staff have been forced into to while they're running on this treadmill of operations and creating the program itself they've been asked to provide language that may end up in a 70-year document that <clears throat> what may constrain their operation um, so i'm just concerned about it uh, and hope that the department um, takes a hard look at whether th these concerns need to be validated <clears throat> or rejected and look to the FMP and the uh, expertise of the staff um, and their ability to adapt and operate. Yeah, thank, thanks, Barrett. I, I appreciate that. You framed it up pretty well. And I would say, you know, I. It is during the scoping team discussions, you know, it was something that um, we, that basically kind of languished in terms of, you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about the big rocks and we're talking about timber harvest and we're talking about roads and we're talking about these things. And it was acknowledged that we'd have to talk about recreation. I guess none of us ever thought it would be quite as big of an issue in some respects as it seems to have become, as you say, over the last few weeks. Um, so we are still working on that. And one thing that that some suggestions that have, we've been given have not done uh, is they've not gone through the scoping team. Um, and so at some point, this does go back through the scoping team for a thorough discussion. And that is our process. We, we take our process and uh, you know, we take ideas and bring them to the scoping team. And the scoping team evaluates and everybody there, uh, whether they're ODF or one of the services or one of our partner agencies with the state, um, brings the science to bear on, you know, okay, what seems to be, not that the science completely answers every question, but what really seems to be the situation here. And we design an effective, come to an agreement on an effective strategy around that. And where we are at odds on something, uh, we can elevate that to the HCP steering committee, um, which you know basically can make a decision, yay or nay, on on how it goes. And that is again, all of all of the agencies represented at the scoping team are also um, on the uh, steering committee, with the addition of OSU uh, is also on the steering committee. But anyway, so there's a process there, and these will go through that process. At the end of the day. Um, if there is something, you know, in there that's being asked for that simply ODF, you know, is not, is not okay with, and it doesn't really matter what the subject matter is, um, as, as we've been told a number of times ourselves, it's our HCP and whatever we write in there and ultimately submit, um, they have to analyze. And so if, if, if there's going to be some take associated with any activity, even recreation, then the onus has really been on them to assess and come back with that and have we adequately minimized and mitigated uh, for that uh, to the extent that we can get an ITP for it as a covered activity. Um, so there's a lot of process to go through still, but I, I just wanna you know, 
hopefully give some reassurance there and at the end of the day, when we see the outcomes uh, from it, it's our HCP and we, you know, we, we submit what we think is, is best. So thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for letting me drag the <clears throat> SFAC out of its lane for a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah. So on the, on, as, as for the agenda, um, <clears throat> I think I've, <clears throat> I've, uh, That'll, that'll conclude my uh, closing thoughts. Any, any other SPAC members have uh, anything they'd like to share and um, something curious forward? Yeah, I just, uh, I just wanted to congratulate all the district staff people for getting these timber sale plant, timber sales out like they are. I know it's increasingly difficult every year to do this and yet uh, they're matching up with the plan very well over a 10 year process under the IP, they're within 1%. I just think that's remarkable and they uh, all need to be congratulated for the good work they're doing. Thanks, Tom. Anything else for the good of, well, let's just say first, are we, uh, Amanda, you got your hand up there. Yeah, just really quick, kind of on the that last piece, Mike, that you presented on for the um, the process moving forward. Is that PowerPoint? Are those slides going to be available for people to pull those dates and um, key key dates off of? Sure, absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. I think it's all stuff that I probably already have written down somewhere else, but uh, just for for ease for everybody. Yeah, and, and they'll also be um, available from the, the board presentation. All I really did here today was uh, rip out a few slides from what we'll be presenting uh, next week. Okay, so are they in, is that uh, information in the board packet right now? Um, no, no, uh, the staff report's in there, but the actual presentations aren't in there until after the board meeting. All right, perfect, thanks for that uh, clarity. Hey, Ron and uh, Andy, do you want to um, orient people around what to expect for next uh, next meetings or what are, what are typical or what we might kind of um, try and prepare for? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, one, at some point in the future, we'll be back together again. And there's still uncertainty, you know, just as an update to everybody, uh, state employees um, for the Oregon Department of Forestry are going to go back to work, uh, stop teleworking uh, as, a, as a standard, you know, full-time practice beginning January 1. And Andy could speak to this a little better than me. He's on our committee that's formulating ODF's approach to how we reopen, uh, you know, state government within the Oregon Department of Forestry. And we're still doing appointments with office closures. But on January 1, it's our intention to go back to open offices and have our employees uh, go back to work. It'll be a hybrid across the state based on needs. We've learned a lot and there are efficiencies from teleworking that we're gonna continue on uh, at different levels in different places with the primary uh, you know, foundation of that being able to supply the services to Oregonians that we need to, we need to supply. But in some, some instances, folks will still be able to telework for a portion of their time, um, not all the time, but they'll be able to telework a portion of the time. And then, you know, we'll have our meeting. Uh, I don't know if April's got a tentative date on, on the calendar, but generally we're looking at an April meeting, I think. Is that right? Yeah, we usually target um, kind of uh, mid to late April um, for our first meeting of the year. That's and correct. again, you know, that would be centered around um, uh, looking at the uh, AOPs. In addition to... Uh some kind of an orientation in <clears throat> February for any new members, something like February. Yep, yep, good catch. Thanks for that, Barrett. Correct, and Ron, I don't have any 2022 dates set just yet. Okay. So that's something we'll need to do. Um, appreciate bringing this up, Barrett. So yeah, we'll have to get together with, uh, you know, Barrett, 
and, and Denise probably and strategize on the most relevant topics for the committee and see what we have on our work plans that relate to SFAC that could be most helpful to us to get advice from you all and then get the dates on the calendar. Uh, there's a key, so that, that, you know, the IOP process coming up is going to be a, a key element of that, what we're doing there. We also have some work we're strategizing on right now for implementation plan revisions. Um, you know, at some point, we're going to need to uh, possibly extend the IPs we have, possibly depending on the FMP timeline. It's not all crystal clear right now, but we're just kind of framing that up. So there may be an update for you in April on just how that's all fitting together as well. Yeah. Um, and, just, and I'd say the timelines of, you know, kind of our traditional meeting schedule may change a little bit in the coming years as we kind of adjust um, the timelines of kind of the planning cycle that we're using and the timelines when we're trying to get input into um, our planning process. So I think, so I think things will be shifting a little bit um, in 22 and 23. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Great. I'm not sure if we'll end up with new members to to think about, but um, keep in mind it's been a, a nice opportunity to invite you know anybody and everybody on on the on SPAC to join that uh, orientation meeting. We've had it in some some cold February days in the field, where either a, a member who's still a newish member or a member who'd like to just help, kind of. Um, uh, folks get their head around all the new stuff flying at them that it's a, it's a nice thing to do even if you're not a, um, if you're not a new member it's 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 great if you can attend if you're so inclined thanks for that Bert that's that's a big help um, because we we you know try to provide an orientation and we're kind of doing that from the department's perspective but one of the greatest values we get out of those orientations is when you've got um, a, a current member of the committee who can then kind of characterize um, what the role is like um, from a committee member perspective. And that's, that's something that only another committee member can provide. And we've had the benefit in past years of having several existing committee members go with us on those tours and in those orientation meetings and in my mind, we get two or three times the value out of that orientation when we've got uh, current uh, SFAC members a part of that. So when we get that scheduled, we'll, we'll let this group know. Um, and, and like I said, typically we've had two to five um, current members able to participate in that. And that adds tremendous value to the orientation. Yeah. Barrett, I, one more thing I just want to touch on probably should have hit it earlier, and I, I might have missed something if Colleen did touch on this, but for the fiscal 23 AOPs, you know, we would normally kind of go over those summaries in the, in the springtime. The planning team is taking a, a different approach to try and get engagement earlier, and that's been a theme, you know, we've talked about with SBAC for, for a long time and gotten advice from you on. So Colleen and the planning team are you know, at some point in November, are going to hold a public information meeting to share the candidate pool for the 23 uh, operations and forest projects that we have. And then there'll be a, a survey period or input period that Jason's crafting, uh, you know, through an online survey that would last approximately six weeks from the time of uh, that meeting, you know, till the end of December, approximately, uh, for, for feedback and input. And we you know, have been architecting this process um, somewhat more recently here, even since this agenda was developed and had I really thought through it at the time, um, would have made sure we really called attention to that during this agenda, because that process will occur prior to the next SFAC meeting. And it is something that we would want to engage with SFAC on uh, as well, not maybe as a committee, not that we wouldn't want to, we don't have a meeting scheduled, but we would want to certainly make sure you were all aware of that public information meeting and the uh, opportunity to provide comment, you know, we will certainly bring the results of that back, you know, to you in the springtime when we talk about the 23 AOP and share what we've done to date on engagement and how it's crafted, uh, what we're bringing forward as a, as a draft fiscal 23 annual operations plan. 
I just wanted to sort of get visibility to that intention we have around uh, public engagement. And Jason, feel free to weigh in if uh, there's something I'm, I'm not characterizing here correctly, or if you want to add anything. Or, or cool. I think you characterize it all right. Okay. He keeps me honest. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just to re, just to um, characterize that more generally, you know, the AOPs typically had been fairly well produced and um, largely baked when presented to a uh, into a public comment period and for our review. And this is opening up the process to kind of transparency and participation at a, a pre before it goes they go in the oven. So it's a significantly extending the public engagement with the development process, not just the comment process. So that's. Uh, it's a good move and uh, hopefully it's um, provides value commensurate with the workload. Um, anybody else uh, have a comment for the good of the order before we adjourn? Boy, uh, thanks. Thanks everybody. Uh, uh, good meeting, appreciate all the staff effort that goes into this uh, AOP review meeting and, and everything else. Uh, we'll call it adjourned. Hey, thank, you. Weekend, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.